Uh, would you bow with me now as I pray? Dear Lord, thank you for this community. Please continue to bless Hendersonville. We pray for our local and national leaders during this election cycle. We also pray for peace, unity, and health during this time. Thank you for this food and bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now if you'll please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, so at this time I'd like to recognize our presenting sponsor, Ascend Federal Credit Union, and now I'll ask Jennifer Stratton to come up and share a few words. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Hi, thank you again. My name is Jennifer Stratton and I am a business development officer with the SIN Federal Credit Union. And we wanted to first thank the Hendersonville Chamber for allowing us to sponsor this luncheon. So as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic that we continue to live through together has been one of the most challenging times in our nation's history, as well as the SIN's history. As an essential business, <clears throat> We have remained open and committed to serving our members throughout this time. And we're doing so while attempting to keep both our members and our employees safe. Ascend remains sound and secure and ready to assist you in any way. You can reach us by our branches or by our many digital options. You can find us online through our mobile option, via phone, as well as in our branches. Our branch here in Hendersonville is located near Lowe's, <clears throat> and we continue to have those extended hours from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday that you can reach us at any time. We are also very excited to announce that we're expanding our service in Sumner County. We're going to open a branch in Gallatin in December, and we're so excited to be uh, uh, investing more in Sumner County. So we want to thank you for your time today, and again, thank the Chamber for allowing us to sponsor this event. I'd also like to recognize our table sponsor today, William Stiles with Country Financial. He is an in insurance representative based here in Hendersonville. Since 1925, Country Financial employees and representatives have been helping individuals and their families achieve financial security. They can help fi provide financial security by working directly with individuals to identify their, spe their specific needs. They then offer a full range of insurance of financial products and services from auto, home, business, farm, and life insurance to retirement planning services, investment management, and annuities. Let's give both of these sponsors a warm round of applause. So just out of curiosity, how many of you have attended a Coffee and Connections recently that the Chamber has sponsored? Okay, great. That's a great show of hands. Uh, I wanted to let you know uh, or invite you all to attend this Thursday's Coffee and Connections. It will be October 8th from 8 to 9. You do not have to register. You can find the link on the Chamber's website. Ralph Schultz, who is president and CEO of the Nashville Chamber, is going to be giving us an update on the economic impact of COVID. So please join us. We'd love to have a, a record turnout for this Thursday and show uh, Hendersonville support to the Nashville Chamber. So now I get the pleasure of introducing someone who needs no introduction. Devin O'Day is a career broadcaster known from Jerry House and the House Foundation and WSM. She is the author of seven books from Thomas Nelson and, Uni and Uni United Methodist Publishing House and narrator of over, over 100 audio books. An award-winning songwriter with cuts by Dolly Parton, Hank Jr., a number one hit from uh, George Strait and more. She is now developer and of new media at Main Street Media with live social media influencer programming and a podcast called Main Street Today. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Devin O'Day.
Well, hello, everyone. I know today is going to be a lot of fun and gentle and sweet and wonderful. It's politics, but we all saw the presidential debates, and ain't nobody want to do that. <laughs> no matter what side you're on, we are a community called Hendersonville, and we are so all glad to be here and be a part of it. And we know that ultimately, everybody here today has Hendersonville down as the priority as to why we're here, why anyone runs, and why everyone should vote. All right, well, let's uh, first of all uh, go over some of our rules. Each candidate today will have two minutes for their opening statements. Um, and we're going to welcome uh, all of our players to be part of it um, as the moderator. Uh, I'd li like for uh, our candidates to go to the podium first and introduce themselves. All right, let's begin first. Uh, introduce yourselves and tell us who you are and how you're qualified to be mayor. Please tell us why you want to be mayor. Thank you. I wanna thank the Hendersonville Chamber and the Hendersonville High School Student Council for making today possible. My name is Brenda Payne and I want to earn your vote. I moved to Hendersonville in 1976. I'm a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother of six. My husband, Jim, is here with me today and we attend community church. I began my career as a file clerk in 1968 at National Life and rose to the position of assistant vice president over the next 21 years. Hal Raymer, who was the president of Volunteer State Community College, asked me to come and lead the foundation. And I did that over the course of nine years and increased that endowment over tenfold and was ultimately named vice president of development. I later went to Sumner Bank and Trust as a business development officer. And in 2008, I was selected as the president and CEO of the Hendersonville Chamber. We built the chamber to a premier regional organization, bringing new business in, supporting existing business, and creating events that strengthened our community fabric. My entire professional and volunteer life has been about connecting people, building relationships in the region, leading and planning, and making our community better for all citizens. I want to bring those skills that have been honed over the past 45 years to a level of a new level of public service. I want to improve communication at all levels, move our economic prosperity forward, and strengthen our community fabric for our most vulnerable citizens. My goal is to bring that same competent, common sense, and caring leadership to the position of mayor. My name is Brenda Payne, and I would be honored to have your vote. Thanks, Devin, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the chamber and what you've done here. A lot of y'all have seen me up here many times and seen me in many places, and I'm very quick to talk about being the mayor of the exceptional city of Hendersonville, and I'm very proud to be the mayor of the exceptional city of Hendersonville. I love Hendersonville. This is where I'm gonna live the rest of my life, and this is where I want my children to come back and live. Certainly we can improve. I want my children, when they come back to live here and they decide where to live here, that they see Hendersonville as an attractive place, just like we do today. But we've got to preserve that. However, certainly we have ways that we can improve. And some of the ways we've improved in the past couple years while I've been mayor is when I took this job, we had only been spending $200,000 on road improvements, on road resurfacing. We multiplied that by 10 in my first budget. We've addressed 70 flooding projects. Those are projects that change people's lives. We've seen an increase in our local sales tax by 20%. That is the economy of Hendersonville growing in 20% in four years. We've also seen businesses investing in Hendersonville in the tune of $130 million in just the past couple years. And we've also added a lot of police officers, which are certainly necessary. 
I also want you to know my positions on a couple things in case they don't come up later on. I oppose having a city administrator on four term limits. I support our police officers in the rule of law. I'm pro-infrastructure. I'm not necessarily anti-growth, but I feel like we've got to get our infrastructure caught up before we continue to overdevelop. I want to finish the Sanders Ferry Greenway, and I am very pleased with our teachers and our principals, and I appreciate them very much for what they do for our community. And I also want to protect our families and our senior citizens from tax increases. That's very important to me, too. And as you're going to see, as we're going to talk about some projects, at least as while I talk about projects, it's very important to me that we talk about the cost of those projects. If you don't talk about the cost of those projects, really you're, not be you're being disingenuous about what you're talking about. So as you talk about projects and ideas and priorities, I'm going to talk about what the costs are. And finally, I want to congratulate the Chamber on 50 years of service to Hendersonville, and I appreciate what y'all do very much. How about a round of applause? Now that's how it's supposed to be done. Local politics affects us more than anything else, truly. It, it affects us where we live, who we are, and our quality of life. And uh, we're going to begin with our moderated questions now. Tina, would you please introduce yourself from the Hendersonville Standard? She will be asking our questions today. I'm Tina Lee, and I write for the Henders I'm a reporter for the Hendersonville Standard, and I've been reporting uh, in Hendersonville since we moved here in 1998. First question, everyone will have one minute to answer each question asked by our moderator, and then each candidate will have a two one-minute rebuttal cards available to redeem during the forum, and each candidate will also have two minutes for their closing statement. So we do have a timekeeper today. Thank you very much. You guys are fantastic. Thank you for keeping us all in, in line and keeping us in time. Let's begin with our first question, Tina. The first question is really a softball question, but let's just start out that way. Um, why should we vote for you? Oh, okay. Well, I believe that I deserve your vote for this reason. I've lived in this community for 44 years. I've spent all of that time working with many different nonprofits and through my professional organizations to make this city a better place. I hear folks say all the time they're hungry for honest and respectful and visionary leadership. I was a co-chair for the Hendersonville Horizons plan about three years ago. I understand the things that this community needs. I have the leadership skills and the management skills to lead this city forward. And I want to bring people together to make that happen. And that's why I think people can vote for me and be proud. Okay. Uh, when I think about the answers to that question, I think of a couple things. I think of my accomplishments and I think of my relationships. Um, not too long ago, the mayors of Sumner County and the leaders of Sumner County elected me to serve the chairmanship of the Emergency Communications Center. That's our dispa dispatch unit for our first responders. They also elected me to serve as chairman of the Sumner County Resource Authority. That's very important as we look at long-term decisions for what's going to happen to our waste. But I also got to look at our relationships that we have and the partnerships we have, especially with our state delegation. I mentioned a month ago that a lot of those folks are my friends, and I very much appreciate what they do to help Hendersonville, but it's also with the Tennessee Department of Transportation. You may have heard me talk about some of the accomplishments recently, and probably the biggest one, and probably the most newsworthy one to me, is what we've gotten TDOT to agree to when it comes to widening Vietnam Veterans Boulevard. Worked with other, other state leaders and local leaders to make sure that when TDOT widens 386, that it's going to be a third lane each direction of unrestricted traffic. It's not going to be HOV, it's not going to be carpool, it's not going to be mass transit. It's going to be unrestricted. It's very important for TDOT, in my experiences with them, that we sit down with them and help them understand how important that is. And certainly there are more accomplishments and more reasons that you should vote for me that you can find on claryformayor.com. Okay, uh, Jamie, we'll give you the first stab at this question. If elected, actually if re-elected, what would be your top three priorities? 
Well, I, I have to say in listening to folks and listening to, uh, to residents of Hendersonville, it comes down to some of the same things we've been working on for a long time. One of the first things is image. Is that it's not, we, we don't always have a real good image when people search for Hendersonville and see some of our city meetings going on, and that's something that dis disappoints me an awful lot. But it's also what's going on in West Main Street and some of the original part of town to spend some more time focusing on <laughs> that and getting the nonprofit that we've started up and running. But it's also bringing jobs to Hendersonville. We have a lot of people that spend an awful lot of time sitting on traffic on I-65. I'd rather they spend their time coming back and spending time with their families. Certainly it's about infrastructure as well, and you're going to hear me talk about that. And I know sometimes it just gets overwhelming as much as I talk about infrastructure. But we're way behind. In terms of being an attractive community, we're wonderfully attractive, but we're going to lose that if we don't maintain our infrastructure. We've got to spend time on that, and like I said, we went from $200,000 spending on road improvements to $2 million in the first year I was mayor. We've got to continue doing that. We've got to get that back up to that level. What would be your top three priorities, Brenda? Thank you, Tina. One of the first priorities that we've got to make happen is to create better communication on our Board of Mayor and Aldermen. We've got to be sure that we have the kind of trust and respect that brings civil discussion at that level. We can't make anything happen. It doesn't matter what kind of plans you want to have but we can't make anything happen until the dysfunction on that board gets to the right place. That is a part of the image process that is sadly lacking in the city of Hendersonville. What I want to do is make sure that we as a board do strategic planning, which hasn't been done in years, so that we know where we're going. You can't know where you're gonna go if you don't plan for it. I want to bring jobs here, and I certainly want to make sure that we support the most vulnerable people in our community, and they are senior special needs folks and youth, and we need to wrap our arms around those folks, and I'm going to bring those people together. Uh, Brenda, we'll give this question to you. What can you do or have you done to help local businesses bounce back in this economy? Please give specific ex examples. Well, as president of the Hendersonville Chamber of Commerce, it was my job for a number of years to support local business. And we did that in an extraordinary way. In fact, when I took over the chamber in 2008, we were in the middle of a recession. We were able to bring hundreds of new businesses to the chamber even through that time because we understood the resources that they needed to make sure that they could thrive in that very difficult economy. So we brought the, the resources through the Small Business Development Office, through Forward Sumner, through uh, the Tennessee Department of Economic Development, and a number of other areas so that they had the training that they needed, the support, the networking that was necessary to make sure that they could continue on and be a successful business. I can do that now. And Jamie, what have you done to help local businesses bounce back in this economy? Thank you, Tina. One of the things that we certainly can do is we can encourage them to take advantage of a lot of the chamber programs. I think there's even a lot of folks that might be in this room that don't understand everything that the chamber offers. But we need to be customers of those businesses. We need to be customers of those restaurants and those local retailers because there really is no longer any need to go to Davidson County anymore. We have what we need right here. And in terms of helping them bounce back, one of the things that we want to do is we want to help those those businesses that have attracted so many people lately, keep those customers. And I, we do that by making sure that people understand what we have available here and what we do. It certainly doesn't hurt that in the past four years, our local sales tax has increased by 20%. So those businesses have done well, and I've heard from a lot of, a lot of businesses that really had great Mays and great Junes, and they need to do their best to keep those customers. But we also need to continue to communicate with them as far as what the restrictions are, and it's something we set up very early on back in March as we started talking to the businesses, we started talking to the pastors, we started talking to leaders in, in shopping centers about understanding what the restrictions are so that they don't end up with a black eye from something that was really unintentional. Jamie, what steps would you take to make sure we are having responsible development? What is responsible development in your opinion? 
Um, the steps we need to make sure to take in responsible development is we have to look at the numbers. We have to look at what happens when we talk about especially residential development versus business development. Business development, to me, we're full out all four. We, that's certainly a helpful in providing services to people in Hendersonville. When we talk about, over, when we talk about overdevelopment and residential development, we have to look at some very data-driven numbers, and that's this. We spend about $900 per person who moves into Hendersonville in terms of city services we receive about $500 per person in what they bring to the city. That's in sales tax and that's in property tax. That's a $400 deficit for other, every new person that moves into the city. Meanwhile, we're trying to catch up with our infrastructure. We have to catch up with our infrastructure first. We can't continue to add new houses when it's a $400 deficit every time somebody new moves into Hendersonville. We have to pay better attention to our infrastructure. I would say that business development is certainly job one. We need to bring new high paying jobs to this city so that our commercial property tax and residential property tax from those new residents will be high. It is really important, however, for us to not forget that rooftops are important for us. Businesses come here for a reason. They come here because there are people. They come here because they need people to support their businesses. It is a balance, obviously. And so this is a really attractive community for people to be here. We want to make sure that our standards remain high, that we're building the right kind of development, that we're managing the growth in a way that is good for us, that we're building the infrastructure at the same time that we build residential developments. Because that's been the problem for years. We've just let those things come after the fact. And the reality is we've got to build infrastructure at the same time. It's a balance. We need both business and residents for economic prosperity. Brenda, do you feel it is important for the city and the chamber to work cohesively to support businesses, conduct events, and prosper economic and community development? If yes, assuming that you would say yes, how do you see your role in continuing to nurture this partnership? Well, that's a great question, Tina. And the reality is, of course, I feel like we need to continue to be a partner with the Chamber of Commerce. I think the Chamber is one of those economic drivers that is one of the best partners that the city could have. But at the same time, we need to have someone in the office of mayor who is working as that leader for economic development. That's what I have done for many years working to be sure that we are at the table and recruiting business into the community so that the Chamber of Commerce can do the things that they do well, which is support the folks on the soft things that they need, continue to have uh, communication between the Chamber and the City of Hendersonville, reduce regulation for those new businesses that come, and support all of our existing business with events that strengthen the community fabric here. Uh, absolutely. I, I certainly encourage a partnership between Hendersonville, the city, and the Chamber of Commerce. But it's got to be a partnership. It's not a dictatorship. It's not the city decides something and tells the chamber they need to get on board. That's not what it takes. It's got to be a partnership. And what I mean by that is that when it comes to the tourism tax that we bring into Hendersonville, we need to make sure that that tourism tax isn't making us lose business. It's not. It doesn't discourage people from coming here. And we need to consult the chamber when we have items like that and we have things that come before us that are, might be priorities to us, but we need to make sure that we get input from the chamber. But we also need to participate in those chamber events. And it's not just the Board of Mayor and Alderman providing a proclamation, but it's the members of the city staff and it's myself and it's other elected people making sure that we go to those events and making th sure that we show up and we praise the chamber for what they're doing and what they're doing for development. But it's also that we need to make sure that we consult the chamber very early on in anything that's going to impact businesses. One of the ways is when we changed our garbage fee last year. We changed our garbage fee so that businesses were, were certainly impacted in a very negative way. It is important to me to get with the chamber and get with the chamber leadership and to get with people who are members of the chamber so they understand the negative impact that was going to have on them. Along with the business questions, 
Um, do you, Jamie, do you agree with BOMA's decision earlier this year to move the city's economic development director under the planning department? In your opinion, should the city have its own economic development department like nearby Gallatin? What type of economic development should Hendersonville pursue? There is no reason to move it under the planning department. It was functioning quite well, and you heard me talk a few minutes ago about the fact that um, we had increased our local sales tax by 20% in four years, and that was done with a previous situation where the, plan where the uh, economic development assistant worked under me. We also have seen Rod do a wonderful job in terms of getting grants for, this, for our biggest businesses here, $240,000. We've also seen our biggest 20 employers increase jobs by 400 people. That was working quite well. There was no reason to change it and put it under the planning department. We don't see successes in other cities that have their economic development people under planning. In fact, there are very few other cities that have economic development under planning because it just doesn't work well. It doesn't work as well as it needs to. Now, certainly there needs to be consultation between the planning department and the economic development people, but it shouldn't be a situation where they respond to somebody in planning. They need to respond to the mayor because the mayor is accountable to the people of Hendersonville and the people in economic development need to work with the same priorities. Well, I believe that economic development needs to be set aside and be a separate part of what is happening in the city. Uh, the ECD director needs to work directly with the mayor, certainly. But I, I would point out that our sales tax revenue didn't just start uh, getting higher over the last few years. While I was at the Chamber of Commerce, of course, the streets of Indian Lake and Glenbrook had begun to come online. And we began to see higher sales tax revenues coming in for the last several years. And I am delighted that people in Hendersonville are supporting our retail and our restaurant here. But we need to be able to bring even more of those businesses here. And we'll do that if we can bring higher paying jobs and better businesses to our city so that we can be sure that we've got that daytime traffic that supports our restaurants and our retail business throughout the time. I certainly am uh, wanting to be sure that I work with the economic development director to bring the best business here to town. That's what I do. It's what I know. Brenda, <clears throat> you may have read in our paper that city leaders voted in 2019 to hire a city administrator to oversee many of the day-to-day -day operations at City Hall that had been handled by the mayor. What do you feel the main role of the mayor is currently, and how are you equipped to fill that role? Thank you for the question, Tina. Of course, I started running for mayor before the city administrator position became a part of the landscape. And that position is in place. And so when I become the mayor, my goal is to honor both the Citizens Committee that made that recommendation, as well as allow the new folks who are gonna be seated on the board to be able to look at the current needs and make a decision about how we move forward. I look at what the mayor's role is to be doing the higher level positions. Those things like strategic planning with the board, recruitment of business here, branding the city, advocating for us, making sure that we're doing all of those visioning things for the city. I can do both of those things. It doesn't really matter to me whether we have a CA or we don't have a CA, quite honestly, because I've done all of those things. But my position will be in working at those higher level things that the city so desperately needs. Uh, to me, one of the most important things I can do as mayor after the election is reverse having a city administrator. I think that's vitally important in talking with folks and listening to what they have to say. They don't want to spend $200,000 on this position. They'd rather have three police officers. They'd rather repave miles of road. They'd rather add to our parks. They'd rather help our schools. That's approximately $200,000 on an experiment that has absolutely failed. So my job after the election is do my best to reverse it. Because to me, it's about accountability. It's about the person who runs the city and supervises the city. It's about that person being accountable to the voters and again this is things that I've listened to voters and heard them talk about so really what we have here because of my position on this is we have the opportunity to have a ref referendum on the city administrator 
We had a lot of people who voted for city administrator and they're up for re-election. If you don't want a city administrator, don't vote for those folks. If you do want a city administrator, vote for those folks. But again, it's about accountability. And we have the opportunity to have a referendum on having a city administrator. I don't want a city administrator long, any longer. And if you don't, please vote for me. Well, Brenda has pulled her card. So, Brenda. Thank you very much. Um, this election is not a referendum on the city administrator. This election is a referendum on who has the best leadership, management, uh, communication, consensus building skills between the two candidates. A city administrator works very well in many other cities around this region. The reality is the position of a city administrator allows the city to run in a way that saves money and that's been demonstrated time and again in many cities. So the, the position of a city administrator is really a chief operating officer that handles the minutia of the business and only does what BOMA asks that person to do. They're not setting tax rates, they're not setting goals, they're not setting vision for the city. They're simply implementing the tactical plans that BOMA has wanted them to do through their strategic planning process. So in my opinion, it is not taking any power away from the mayor at all. It's just an adjunct professional person. Okay, along those lines, Jamie, City leaders voted this year to decrease the mayor's salary from 100,000 around to around 42,000, uh, beginning with the November 3rd election. Currently, do you see the mayor's job as a full or part-time position? If elected, would you vote to increase the mayor's salary? Well, when there's a small study done on this about mayors and other cities with city administrators, one of the things that came up over and over and over again was people, it, that mayors that had a city administrator, they still work part-time. And it was very obvious that the work that they did was such a priority that they need to be there part-time. I'm still working 45 hours a week, if not more. And so it's obvious in this situation that it is full-time. I propose that we could have had a chief of staff and somebody that still be responsible to the mayor and still be responsible to the people of Hendersonville and still have accountability to the people of Hendersonville. And unfortunately, that didn't pass. But it's, to me, it's very important that we look at, if we're gonna look at one person's salary, we certainly look at what they're doing. The way that that was changed was completely arbitrary. It was one member of our, it was one alderman throwing out a number and another number throwing out another number. There is no study done at all as far as what other mayors doing. There is no consideration for what the responsibilities are. There is no consideration for how many employees there are. There is no consideration for how how big the budget is. And I gotta tell you, for somebody who signs a million dollars in checks every week, the responsibilities are still pretty high. Well, I never took on this task of running for mayor because of the salary. And in fact, um, the salary has never even been a consideration for me. I do not believe that the mayor's job even with a city administrator is a part-time position because there are too many other things that a mayor will need to do that will create that as a full-time job. And I'm gonna say this, I have never taken a position in my life that was not bigger after I got there than it was before I started. And that will be exactly what happens when I become mayor of the city because I will be working with that city administrator and all of the department heads who currently report to the board of mayor and aldermen. That's been the structure all along and it continues to be the same structure. Brenda, uh, in your opinion, what needs to be done to repair or mend relationships between BOMA members that appear to have been strained over the past few years? Give a recent example of a time when you helped build consensus between two opposing sides. Well, I think the thing that needs to happen is we've got to build trust and respect on that board. We've got to make sure that people understand there aren't the Shalom Zone Board, which I've chaired twice, 
and we had to build consensus about where we were going to move in terms of building uh, an, a new gymnasium there and how we were going to, to make that happen. It was a pretty contentious issue because we're talking about raising another couple of million dollars. So those are things that I've done for a long, long time. Uh, but I think it's important to uh, take the temperature down on that board. I am not a career politician. I have not been uh, a political hack at all, and so it is, uh, it's not something that I bring baggage to the position. Thank you. I appreciate that, Tina. Um, one of the things I, I think we have to look at is we have to look at a lot of other cities and the history of other cities and the history of Hendersonville. Very often the mayor, because they have a different perspective of what they're doing every day, very often they find themselves voting the minority. Very often they find themselves voting alone, and that happens in a lot of cities, and that happens, has happened in the history of Hendersonville. Um, but I got to say something. I think sometimes we forget that we have a lot of examples of recent consensus. I appreciate you asking for one. I'm going to cite several. We recently passed a new zoning ordinance. That was something that passed unanimously. That is a huge document and could have the possibility to be incredibly contentious. It passed absolutely unanimously because we had so much time ahead of time. We had so much conversation ahead of time about that, but also addressing flooding problems and again those are life-changing events for a lot of people who live here to address the situation with their homes we rebuilt a fire hall and we've added police officers and firefighters we've increased spending on roads and we've also added our license plate recognition system this is huge that was something that the board got on board with very quickly when it was presented to from the police chief to me and then from me to the board to have those license plate recognition cameras and we recently caught two violent sex offenders with the help of those City leaders voted last year to eliminate a separate trash fee for residents and instead pay for trash collection from the city's general fund. Some business owners who pay for their own trash collection said this places an unfair burden on them. What is your position on having businesses subsidize the residential trash pickup? Would you be in favor of going back to the way it was before? Absolutely. Uh, it is an absolute unfair tax for them is that they were not receiving the service and they're not gonna receive the service, but now they're paying for that service. And they're essentially, like you said, Tina, they're subsidizing residential trash service for people. I absolutely would like to see it reversed. And for 40 years in Hendersonville, it has been that way and we've stood out as a model for other cities and other cities have, co have, have copied us on this because we had an example that absolutely made sense. The people who get trash service, they pay for the trash service. The people who don't, they don't. What was reversed last year was absolutely wrong. And I reached out to several businesses and helped them understand what was going to happen. And they showed up at meetings and they, and, and they let their aldermen know that they were against that. And in terms of attracting businesses in Hendersonville, we just lost one thing that we had to help attract them. We lost something very positive that helped attract them because it wasn't just their property tax that was low, but it was also the fact that they could go out and, and make sure their property taxes stay low because they weren't paying for other people's trash. I would absolutely want to see that reversed. Well, I think this was an example, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The reality is we cut our service in half. We didn't listen to our people. We didn't plan for this. We didn't communicate it, and we didn't execute it very well. I will always be against taxes that go to businesses when they're not getting services. Uh, we, we need to make sure that we come back and renegotiate this. Um, the leadership at the city could have built consensus to have avoided this sort of circumstance. And so the reality is we need to come back to the table, identify what we can do to renegotiate this, move this back along. Um, we've cut the service in half and basically have not saved any money. And so this, this has not been good for our city. It has certainly not been good for our business community. And I want to make sure that we are placing as little regulation on our business as we possibly can, and certainly not uh, unnecessary taxes for services that they're not receiving. Okay, rebuttal. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think one thing we have to remember is how we got to this situation was that uh, in March of 2019, Republic Services was providing trash service for us. I asked them if they would extend that contract that was going to end in June, and Republic Services said no. 
So that made our staff have to go out and accept bids for new trash service. At that, soon after that, our board decided to hire Waste Pro, a different company, and they decided to go to once a week backdoor trash pickup. It really had nothing to do with the way the businesses were impacted. That was a completely separate decision. And unfortunately, we brought in a city administrator about the same time. The idea with the city administrator was going to address things like this. It was going to address problems like this. As you see from the trash problems, that hasn't worked. And the city administrator has an absolutely failed experiment, experiment, and it's cost us more than $100,000, and we absolutely need to reverse that. But what's more important is that we continue to listen to businesses, and we continue to listen to individual residents here and do what they really want to be done. But when you don't have somebody who's going to pick up your trash, you've got to go out and find somebody to pick up the trash, and that's what we did. Okay. Does Jamie get the next question? Okay. Each of you have used one rebuttal card. And uh, we are now at 1227. So just giving you a, a brief overview of the time and where we are in that. And we'll begin closing statements at 1250. Okay. Speaking of trash, the city has had issues with Waste Pro, the company that collects trash for the city, since the company took over trash collection in July of 2019. What would you remedy the issues, this, how would you remedy the issues the city has had with the company, Jamie? I appreciate that. I mentioned a little bit about that. I guess I sort of jumped the gun there a second ago. Um, we don't have the opportunity to renegotiate a contract. We don't have the opportunity to cancel a contract. When I hear people talk about that, they don't understand the business side of this. That contract was written by our city attorney and it was signed by both sides. What we need to do is we need to enforce that contract. I asked at a board of mayor and alderman meeting a couple months ago for our city attorney, excuse me, our city administrator to enforce that contract, and he refused. What I mean by enforcing that is when the company, and this is in the contract, when the company skips the house, they can be fined $50. That's significant. They make $3 when they pick up the house correctly. We need to enforce that contract. We will get better trash service when they understand that we're going to enforce that contract. $3 versus $50 is really going to make them stand up and pay attention, and it's going to improve the trash service but it takes the city administrator or it takes the mayor if we eliminate the city administrator after this election. Well, I've never seen a contract that couldn't be renegotiated, so I, I'm not sure that that's actually the case, but I think we need to bring that back up to the newly seated board of mayor and aldermen when we get there. The reality is, yes, we need to execute that plan we need to hold the trash vendor accountable for what they are not doing. We need to make sure that they are doing everything that they can, that they are funded properly through the employee base, that we, uh, they understand where all the streets are, uh, that uh, they are moving toward getting everything picked up. We cannot afford to have residential streets go week after week after week. And so I absolutely would be making sure that they are accountable. I think we're in agreement with this, uh, but the uh, reality is contracts can, in fact, be renegotiated. And even if the contract's not renegotiated, I will bring them back to the table so that they understand very clearly what the expectation is so that we get the right job done. Part of this next question, Brenda, was, you've already answered, um, would you be in favor of renegotiating the, the contract with Waste Pro? Um, the other part of the question is, are you satisfied with once a week backdoor service, or would you like to see the city move to more frequent curbside service? Well, I get once a week, and we don't really produce that much trash. But there are many families around this community that once a week is just not sufficient. And I will say it again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Twice a week pickup was certainly what our community had been used to. And we needed to not be looking at a way to change that. What's happened with this is the contract that got negotiated with Waste Pro wound up not picking up all of the things that our previous vendor had picked up. So now we've got yard waste and other items that they don't pick up, and they wind up coming through and uh, going through the trash to see what it is they're not going to pick up. 
our public works department has had to backfill that activity, which means that we're spending more money at the city that we didn't have to spend before. So we have not saved that much money on this contract. Appreciate that, Tina. Uh, we've saved somewhere between one and a half and I think $1.7 million with this contract. But to me, the answer to the question is really it's up to residents and how residents feel. We have a lot of people that are moving in here um, from other places where they were used to once a week or they were used to curbside. And that's something that we all considered. I think I can speak for all the board of mayor and aldermen is that we considered a lot of the comments we heard from people before we made that decision. But if you want to change it, if you want to do something more expensive, I have to ask, how do you pay for that? Right now, we're really stretched. We're very, very much stretched. Money that really should have gone to roads, we've cut that back. You heard me mention $2 million for roads a couple years ago when I prepared the budget. This year, it's down to a million. So if you add a new expense, you've got to find somewhere to cut it. Or you have to raise taxes. I don't want to back ourselves into the corner where we have to raise taxes. And as far as yard waste, to me, this is one of the things that we've had successfully done in Hendersonville. We have less trash per household going to landfills right now because our yard waste is now being recycled. It's not going to a landfill anymore. We were under the impression before that that was not the case, and we found out later on that it was the case. But we have more recycling going on right now per household than we did before I was mayor, and that's because our yard waste is being recycled and turned into mulch. Did I go over? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, um, would you like to see the city offer a citywide recycling program to its residents? If so, how would you propose paying for this? I appreciate that, Tina. Um, and I, that's a very good question, especially the second part. I'm passionate about recycling. I was the first mayor in the history of the city to start a recycling program. And it's a pilot program to see how it go and to see how it would do. Fortunately, um, we found out a lot of information before we went much bigger. The industry changed in those 18 months. China quit accepting our, our, our dirty plastic and our dirty cardboard, and everything changed worldwide. We're fortunate that we have Green Village here because they are picking up the slack and they are allowing people to recycle, and they're doing wonderful work for us, which means overall, we all send less stuff to the landfill, and that's hugely important to us. But as far as the second question, that's very important. We sought businesses to come out and offer to have a drop-off point for our garbage, and nobody wanted to do that work. We also saw businesses start a curbside program, and we had a couple bids. The least it would cost us is $1.2 million. We can't just absorb that cost in our general fund right now. I gotta tell you, I'm passionate about, about recycling, but I'm not willing to raise taxes on people to have a recycling program that costs that kind of money. Well, I'm also re um, passionate about recycling. We've recycled at our house for many years, and I think it's something that many people in this community would like to see happen. But the reality is recycling is something that does cost money. Goodlettsville has a very effective and efficient recycling program, and I plan to go and talk with those folks to find out how they're doing that. But the Fact of the matter is, we've got a couple of vendors here in town. They're small business owners. It's a great opportunity for us as a community to support those small businesses and make recommendations and provide resources to, to our community base to let them know where they can get those recycling services if they'd like to. But if there's an opportunity to find other ways to do it, then I think we deserve to look at those and, cr and bring those to us, not to raise taxes, not to spend money, but to provide a service for our citizens who want it. Okay, Brenda. Um, I was doing some research and came across an article in the Tennessean from 1979 that talked about the importance of aligning Old Shackle Island Road, Main Street, and Walton Ferry Road. The project, according to the article, dates back to at least 1977. Both. Sorry, I was in kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. 
both the traffic light synchronization project and a new connector road at the Saundersville Road Railroad Crossing have each been discussed for more than a decade. What would you do differently to try to move these projects forward with the Tennessee Department of Transportation, who, by the way, seems to always get blamed for these projects? Should the city look at ways to be less reliant on the state for some of these projects? Well, thank you, Tina. That is an interesting question. And in fact, that project is almost as old as I am, and that's really pretty bad. Um, so um, what I would say about that is there have been numbers of mayors involved in these projects for the last 35 plus years. And we as an organization and a city have got to continue to have relationships both at the state level as well as within our own county level to collaborate and push those projects ahead. I am always going to be willing to pick up the phone and call the people who are influential in making those things happen. I've had people in my life say that I am like a terrier dog and I will not rest until those things happen. But I will work collaboratively with the organizations here in our own county to make this happen. We have to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. You heard me mention a little bit earlier about partnerships. It's important to me that I have partnerships with our state delegation, with TDOT, and it's not just the assistant commissioner and the commissioner of TDOT, but it's also the maintenance guys that are in the, in the shop in Gallatin. The synchronization project is very frustrating to me. That got delayed because of an error that happened in 2015 that TDOT didn't even acknowledge until just a couple months ago. But we've sat down with them recently, we've overcome some hurdles, and that project is getting back on track. They've also, I've got to appreciate TDOT for the work on New Shackle Island Road, a project that went forward wonderfully. And we widened New Shackle Island Road not too long ago. And I also have to thank them for their work on Vietnam Veterans Boulevard and, ex and their decisions on expanding Vietnam Veterans Boulevard. And that really comes from the relationships that I, as well as the other mayors of Sumner County and Ford Sumner have with our folks at TDOT. But when you talk about these projects and you talk about the alignment project that is purely a, a state project and we contribute to it, what we run into is when they handle it, it's their money, we have to work on their timeline. When you talk about the tunnel over here, that's a $12 million project. If we want to handle that project, we have to double our property taxes. It's a 10 or $12 million project we're going to continue to seek federal money for. Along those lines with the projects that I mentioned and maybe another one that might come to mind, um, in your opinion, what is the most important project needed for our city and how would you propose paying for it? When I, when I think of, of I assume it was me. Okay, okay. When I think of projects like that, I'm very data driven, is I have to consider the cost. I have to consider as a need versus a want. I have to consider what residents are saying. Uh, and very often, it's better roads and it's infrastructure improvements. But if you want to talk about one project that's very important to me, it's the Sanders Ferry Greenway. Certainly the other projects and regular maintenance of infrastructure are hugely important to me. But the Sanders Ferry Greenway is something that's been out there for a long time. And it certainly helped the businesses along there and help us bring jobs and help us to continue to bring revenue. Um, if there's any other thing that I put out there, it would be our continued work with schools. Is the SMORE program that I started three years ago has been incredibly successful for students that have a hard time reading, and they drop off their reading skills in the summer. And it's something that the relationships I have with businesses help support that, so there's no tax money going to that. And along with that, I have to say if there's one other thing, I'd like to see all of our schools being rated a 10 when it comes down to what they're rated on, greatschools.org. Thank you. Well, I would have to say that as I've been walking neighborhoods, I hear constantly that my road needs to be paved. I have watched roads all through this city that have not been paved in over 35 years. They're down to the gravel. People are busting tires as they're going along in their neighborhood. And so we have got to find a way to develop either grant funding for the paving that we have got to do in this city, or we need to find some other ways to reduce our bond indebtedness and assure that we can pull some additional bonding to make a greater impact on paving. Uh, paving is something that 
people say to me every day as I'm going through. And we need to, to do more than just put a top coat on the road. We need to actually make the road a better road. So those are things that, that I hear throughout the city, and it's going to be one of my top priorities. Thank you. Um, we want to give a shout out right now to Hendersonville High School. We have students who are watching on live stream. And we want to thank a couple of those students for helping us. They drew, actually, who was going to take the first question today. So thank you for that. And they've also um, submitted a question uh, today. And they want to know, and I guess this is you, Brenda. Um, why is it important for the citizens to get involved in city leadership, and why would someone want to run for mayor? <laughs> and I'm alderman as well. Well, you know, I've asked myself that question a few times, as a matter of fact. Um, I think it's really important for people to get engaged and active in their city and in politics. What happens here locally is the most important thing that affects all of us as citizens in Hendersonville. If we are not paying attention to what we're doing at BOMA, if we're not paying attention to the projects that we need, if we're not paying attention to how our taxes are being spent, then we have not done our civic duty. I had someone tell me about 15 years ago, Brenda, public service is one of the most important things that you can do in your life. I've tried to do a lot of public service throughout my life through nonprofits, but this level of public service where you impact everybody in the city and how they live is why we need to be a part of this. Thank you, Tina, and thank you, Hendersonville High School. Um, I think the simple answer to that question, I've got a couple answers to that, but the simplest is because I love Hendersonville. Um, I graduated from Hendersonville High School, and I've lived here for an awful long time, and I intend to live here much, much longer, and I hope my children come back and live here. This is not a stepping stone. Some people seek public office so they can seek, uh, seek additional public office. That's not me. Uh, this is a job that I want. This is a job that I do well, and this is a job that I want to continue to hold. Um, I also think it's very important that the mayor be a person that supports our first responders, our firefighters, and our police officers. That's a huge priority for me, and I want to make sure that the mayor, that the person in the mayor's office, that that's a priority for them. I, like I mentioned before, I want to keep Hendersonville attractive. We're an exceptional city right now. We've got to continue to listen to the people that are here as well as the people that move in so that we can preserve Hendersonville, preserve what it is that they love about Hendersonville. Again, certainly I see that there's need for improvement. What it comes down to is that the reason that I want to be in public service, the reason that I want to be mayor, is because I feel like I'm the best person to lead this city. And I realize that sounds a little bit arrogant that I'm better than anybody else, but it's because of the vision and the, and the experience and the time that I've spent here that allows me to say that. Thank you. This is another question that has come from a viewer via live stream. How can the city partner with nonprofits to not duplicate services and maximize resources and investment in our community? It's a very good question, and we have a nonprofit committee, and we also have requests that come in through me, and it's an awful lot of collaboration. It's working with our nonprofits. One of the things I did very early on when it came to COVID hitting, hitting us is I sat down, actually, I didn't sit down, I called, and I, and I Zoomed later on with a lot of people that were involved in our nonprofits, and I appreciate very much what United Way did during that time, is they really became a catalyst, really a conduit for me to reach out to some of those folks and understand some of the problems. We also have to realize that our biggest nonprofits are our churches. It's very important to me to sit down with pastors a couple years ago at one of their regular luncheons, but it's also important to me that I maintain those relationships with them so I can understand what the services are that they're providing and what it is that they're being expected to provide. We've got to continue doing that, not just with the nonprofits in the traditional senses, but the nonprofits that are churches, because they are serving an awful lot of folks here that may be under the radar that we don't understand. Now, in terms of not duplicating services, I want to make sure also that we continue to communicate with them and help them understand that they need to communicate with each other as well. Well, this is one of those areas where I must agree with a lot of what the mayor said, but I, th I think there are other things that we can do. I have chaired the board of United Way of Sumner County twice, 
have been the fundraising co-chair for United Way of Sumner County. I've raised money all over this community for a variety of nonprofits. So I have a lot of relationships with those organizations. United Way does a great uh, job in making sure that duplication of services doesn't happen. But one of the things that I've talked about as I've gone all over this community is I recognize that there are at least three different areas of folks who are really vulnerable in this community. Our seniors, our youth, and our special needs persons. And what I want to do when I get there is gather those folks who work with those different agencies, let them figure out what they're doing today, what are the gaps, how can they fill in those gaps, so that we can strengthen the community fabric here and provide the kind of services that our really vulnerable population needs. And so I I think that's one of the biggest things that I can do as mayor. Brenda, what do you feel like your biggest challenge would be if you were elected mayor? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge right out of the gate is really just creating that lack of dysfunction on our board of mayor and aldermen. And so I've said that before. We've got to take the temperature down there. We've got to find a way to build trust and respect among that body so that we can speak civilly, so that we can be friends when we walk out of those meetings. We're not always going to agree on what the issue might be, but we can do it respectfully. And that is important because what's happening today is our image throughout the region and even throughout the nation is being tarnished because folks are looking at what's happening there. So that dysfunction has got to be reduced. That way we can begin to actually do the work that the city of Hendersonville uh, is so desperately needing and you want for your city and, and to, to grow and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. The biggest challenge that I see repeatedly when I listen to folks that live here, and especially folks that move in here, is they want more from city government. They expect more. And it's, it's tough to satisfy everybody. We know that we can never please everybody. But it's, it's one of the things that we hear very constantly is to provide so much for people. And they talk about the amenities that they might have had somewhere else or the amenity that somebody had in a different city. And what it comes down to is we have to talk about cost. So we have to talk about is it a want or is it a need? Is it a good investment and does it make sense? Now, I proposed impact fees last year and that failed. It certainly would have helped with some of these wants and some of these needs and unfortunately that didn't pass. So what we're in the situation we have to do when it comes to challenges and providing what people want is we really have to maintain what we have and we have to determine the needs from the wants. In the past four years, we've opened a new green greenway off Saundersville Road. We've also um, opened three new parks, and we've, we've created a bunch more sidewalks. Very proud of that. So if I think of really the challenges and responding to folks what they want, one of my highest priorities I just mentioned a few minutes ago, the Sanders Ferry Greenway. That's a huge priority for me, and that's going to continue to be. Before we move into the next questions, now we're getting into the closing arguments. Tina Lee from the Hendersonville Standard, amazing questions. Thank you for what you've done. And we want to thank, that, yes. And a big thank you for our city leaders in the making at Hendersonville High School for weighing in on this conversation. And for everyone who has joined us via social media, one thing COVID has taught us is that social media is a powerful medium and you can all be a part of this conversation with your comments, with your shares. We want you to be a part of this. And one thing that we do know, no matter what, we have two candidates who love Hendersonville. Am I right? So we're going to give each of you, because we have been so good with time and so good with each other, each of you have three minutes for your closing statements. We'll begin first with Brenda and then move to Jamie, our incumbent, to close. Thank you, Devin. And thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, please. And Tina and, and all the folks here at the chamber, Kathleen and her staff, for being uh, so willing to work hard to make this happen today. I am honored to have lived here for over 44 years. 
I'm particularly honored that I have received the endorsements of both the Hendersonville Firefighters Association and the Fraternal Order of Police, as well as endorsements from so many people around this community. My goal is to bring competent, common sense, and caring leadership to all of the citizens of our great city. As I've talked to people all over this city, what I hear is they're hungry for honest and respectable and visionary leadership. They're hungry for someone who will listen to everyone. And they want someone who will bring people around the table to solve not only our current problems, but also to be aspirational about our future. I've listened to you through my role in the visioning process with Hendersonville Horizons. And so we already have a guidepost for where we want to take this city in the future. And I've met so many people who really want to be a part of that planning process for our city. I can and will bring my business experience, my leadership, my integrity, and my regional relationships as investments in our prosperity. I'm not afraid to ask the hard questions, and I'm not afraid to make the hard decisions. I will work every day to make our city the best city that it can be. I want people in four years to look around and say, oh my, what is going on up there? They really have their act together. I want to serve you. You will never call my office and hear me say it's not my job. It will always be my job. My name is Brenda Payne and I want to be your mayor. And I would be honored to have your vote at early voting and on November 3rd. Thank you and God bless Hendersonville. Thanks, Devin, and thanks for your, uh, your leadership today. I appreciate that. And thank you, uh, uh, Kelly and uh, Kathleen and Tina. I appreciate you all very much. Um, my background a little bit uh, that I didn't get to get to a little bit earlier was I've worked in local, state, and federal government. Um, so I understand the differences in the responsibilities of those governments and the difference in their priorities of those governments. But by far, most of my life has been in private sector, more than 20 years. Ten of those years was in economic development, where I worked with companies that wanted to bring jobs to local communities. I worked in 23 states and two other countries and I'm very proud of the work that we've done there and it helped me understand really what works well in communities and what doesn't. But it's been interesting today to hear uh, so much scrutiny of my past actions and I'm fine with that. Um, I've been mayor for four years, I was alderman for four years, I was planning commissioner for six years. Uh, but I have so many past actions to scrutinize because I have experience in public service. By contrast, my opponent doesn't have anything to scrutinize. Voters can't look at her past and ask questions about her previous public actions because she doesn't have any. Voters can't get a sense of how she will govern because she doesn't have experience governing. This contrast is due to my experience. I have more experience in public service, and every time I'm criticized for my actions without explaining what she would have done, she exemplifies how much more experience I have. And she tells us how much more qualified I am to be mayor. In the past couple months, I've accepted more than 600 contributions from people who live in Hendersonville. I'm very proud of the fact that we have that from people who live in Hendersonville that support me and invest in me. I've only taken about 4% of my contributions from out people who don't live in Hendersonville. By contrast, the other campaign has more than 49% of their contributions coming from people who don't live in Hendersonville. I've also only received about 1% 1, about 1 of my money for my campaign has come from people in the development industry. People are going to make money on continuing to overdevelop. People are gonna make money on more houses and more apartments. My opponent has received about 30% of her campaign contributions there. And I think that's important because we've gotta preserve what we have in Hendersonville. It's absolutely imperative that we do that. And again, it's important that we improve. And when you look at the infrastructure we, we improvements that we've made here in the past couple of years, I'm very proud of those. We still need to move forward. But you also look at my interaction with schools, that's very important as well. The number one driver of our property values and protecting that investment preserving Hendersonville is how good our schools are. No mayor has spent more time in our local schools than I have. But really what it comes down to in this race to me is, do you want Nashville to come to Hendersonville? Do you want somebody like Nashville's mayor's John Cooper or do you want somebody who loves Hendersonville? 
and somebody wants to preserve what we have here today. We have an exceptional city, and I hope you'll look at my accomplishments and what I've been able to do in the past four years. Look at them from what, from what we've talked about today, and look at them at, online at clarifromair.com, and I hope you'll vote for me. Thank you so much. You, you each have a 60-second rebuttal card, and you can use those now. Brenda wants to use hers. Thank you very much. I think my business background and my experience with nonprofits speaks volumes to the experience and the leadership that I have brought to this community for over 44 years. The reality is I have tried to lead a very positive campaign. I have spent no time attacking my opponent at all. I have challenged him a couple of times when he has brought things out in the public specter that were absolutely untrue. And so today, I guess I will have to spend another couple of minutes talking about that. I've received contributions from people in all sectors of business in this community, from bankers and lawyers and ministers and doctors and retirees and car dealers and, yes, from builders. But my contributions from builders represent about 6% of the contributions that I have. And so the idea that I am in the pocket of someone is just not true. I want to make this community better for everyone who owns a business. They are a part of our community. And I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that. Thank you. All right, Jamie. Okay, appreciate that. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about my background, a little bit of my service in the past. Um, I have a degree in government, and like I mentioned, I've worked in state, uh, federal, and uh, local uh, governments. I also wrote the book on the history of Hendersonville, the city by the lake. It took me about six and a half years to write that, but it was a great education for Hendersonville, and it was a great education for government. Um, I've also been involved in government, like I said, uh, four years as mayor, as a planning commissioner, and I was an alderman. Being mayor is not an entry-level position. You need to have that experience in government. I've created three budgets over $50 million while I've been mayor, and I supervised 360 employees during this time. And the reason I bring this up is because there's been conversation about qualifications. I bring this up because the best qualification for this job is to have done the job well. Thank you. Thank you to our candidates. Please give them a round of applause. And thank you to all of you for showing up, for caring enough about your hometown that you showed up to hear people talk about why they want to be mayor. Showing up and showing up at the polls is a privilege and a right that not everybody exercises. So we're glad that you're here. And we want to thank the people who helped set this up, this amazing Area Chamber of Commerce for Hendersonville. A round of applause for Kathleen Hawkins and her team. Incredible. Aaron and Stephanie, and of course Jeff, Aaron, and Simply Done for doing an amazing job with getting this online because not everybody could be here today. There are only so many seats to respect our social distancing. A lot of people would have loved to have been here, but they couldn't. And so we thank you guys for helping this get the word out. Share, share this, be part of the process. And we thank Tina Lee, those were great questions. We encourage you to be a subscriber of your hometown paper, the Hendersonville Standard, who is constantly asking the tough questions and getting the information out and into your homes, both digitally and both with a physical newspaper. Subscribe if you don't. Be a part of what we do. Follow us on our Facebook pages because your questions can be aired there as well. I'm Devin O'Day, and I appreciate you for being here. God bless you all, and God bless Hendersonville. Thank you.